Thank you. So if I could invite to the stage uh, Jenny, Rebecca and Nick. Um, so during the next session, we'll focus on measuring healthcare improvements. So we have with us uh, Jenny Earhart, who's the Group Chief Finance Officer, Manchester University NHS Foundation Trust, also chairs the Finance Innovation Forum, um, who are launching the Engagement Value Outcome Framework. Uh, we have Dr. Rebecca Chubb, who's the Deputy Clinical Director, and Nick Wilding, who's the Costing Manager, both at North Staffordshire Combined Healthcare NHS Trust, who have piloted that framework in 2019. So over to you, Jenny. Thank you. Th thank you, Peter. And, and thank you, Julian. And just before I, I get started, um, Julian was talking about the uh, Nye Bevan speech. Um, last year I read his book, In Place of Fear. I think somebody put it on Slido, actually. I'd really recommend that as well. It's... Uh, really really interesting context um about why in a sense uh, why we're here um so yeah so i don't need to say hello my name is jenny because uh, pete's already done that um i'm really excited to introduce two colleagues uh, from north staffordshire combined healthcare and back in 2019 they agreed to be the mental health pilot site for the engagement value outcome framework um, i'll come back after their presentation to describe a bit more about what we what we're doing is the innovation forum uh, around this um, and actually to launch the, the EVO framework, as Pete said earlier. Um, the pilot, though, sought to introduce patient level costing information to clinical teams and to show that benefit of working together um, and, the, and the benefits of that data set and what can be driven as a result of really good understanding and, and interdisciplinary understanding of that data set. Um, and I think, as Julian said, our best work is with clinicians and with ops teams, isn't it? Um, so I'm delighted to uh, welcome four years later um, Becky Chubb, uh, Deputy uh, Clinical Director of North Staffordshire, North, North Staffordshire Directorate, so I put my teeth in, um, and Nick Wilding, Costume Manager. So thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, apologies if there's a few nerves and um, as a, a jobbing NHS doctor you are very much not my typical audience um, so <laughs> so uh, here we go so um, we're going to talk to you about um, our work that we did um, as part of the EVO project um, and I'm obviously going to give you more of the kind of clinician side of things and then Nick's going to give you more of the kind of finance side of things so the story starts back in 2019 wind back your minds to 2019 there had been no pandemic uh, if you talked about corona, people assumed you were thinking about a beer. Um, I hadn't been asked to raise my hand, I don't think, since I'd been at school. Um, and as a very new consultant at the time, I don't think I had ever met a costing manager. Until Evo came along. Yeah, so just, just to describe, I mean, it, it feels such a long time ago. It is a long time ago now, 2019. But it's, it's a good doorway into uh, telling you what Evo was like then, and, and kind of then you'll be told perhaps a little bit by Richard and the team about, of how it's evolved and what it's become now. It's obviously changed a lot. But back then it was uh, a framework that we signed up to um, where we committed to looking at three service areas, uh, with a multidisciplinary team, that's finance, performance, informatics, and clinical uh, and managers as well. Um, and it involved, it was a really snappy process. A few short meetings, the first one, got together, brainstormed which areas we wanted to look at, which projects. Then the second meeting, we came back with data and information and said, this is the evidence, this is the information we can provide to you. Lots of information, lots of charts and graphs. And then the third meeting, the clinicians, would then uh, say, right, what do we want to do with this information to affect change? Because that's what it's all about, affecting change, to add to the patient pathway and the patient care. So, and why did we do it? Clinical engagement had always been tricky. It is for every trust. Um, we had great data, but so what? So we used to take it to the clinicians and say, look at this, and they'd say, yeah, that's great, but so what? What do we do with it now? Um, so this was a framework that actually they were able to put focus on those projects and look at them in depth and do something with it. Uh, and we were passionate about using PLIX, and we always had been, so we wanted to do something to start getting it to work for us. Thanks. So, um, like Nick said, there was a few clinical areas that um, 
uh, were chosen, but the, the one I work in and the one we're just going to share today is the memory service. Um, just to give you a bit of context, I mean, memory service, it, it kind of does what it says on the tin, right? Um, it's about assessing people's memories. So it's generally people over the age of 60. And our aim is really to try and pick up dementias as early as is possible. Um, it's a really busy service. We cover the whole of North Staffordshire. And at the time, we were getting about 200 referrals a month. That will, as will come as no surprise to you, has gone up considerably as we've come out of the pandemic. And the memory clinic's made up of a team of nurses, doctors, psychologists, um, OTs, etc. So a real multidisciplinary team. So the problem. Um, the pathway we had at the time was, um, I feel like conveyor belt's a bit of a mean term to give it, but it was a very linear pathway. So all the patients were referred in, they all saw a nurse, they all went off for a head scan, they all came back to see a doctor, and then they all went on to see a nurse again. So it was a very simple, consistent, easily applicable pathway, but the problem was it was quite inflexible. Um, and it was hard for patients to step in and out of the pathway. It was hard for us to really flex around what the patient needed in that pathway. Um, like I said, all patients, because they all went through the same pathway, they all went off for a head scan, and most of that was clinically perfectly appropriate, but there were some patients in there we knew who probably didn't need to go off for a head scan for various clinical reasons. Um, we had a real bottleneck as well in that step between coming in and seeing a nurse and then coming back and seeing a doctor, and it's at that doctor appointment that you would get your diagnosis. And for the patient, that was the important appointment, really, because that's where you got told, essentially, whether we thought you had a dementia or not. Um, again, as similar with many, many other services, we had lots of DNAs, and of course, when you're scrapping around for every last appointment, that's a real frustration on our part. And, and from my perspective as a clinician at the time and as a new consultant, I kind of had lots of ideas, but I'll be honest, they were clinical hunches and not a lot more than that. I had pieces of paper and pencil scribblings of what I thought it could look like and how we could improve it. To, but to be perfectly honest, I didn't really know where to begin. Yes, yeah, so just a bit about the type of information we we were sharing with the clinicians and the managers. So we used, we examined Plex data, studied our activity information dashboard, AID, which we produced way back in 2018. And that gives you granular data, looking at the patient interventions, how long we spent with the patients, how many contacts were happening per staff member, all that kind of information. Um, we linked it to our service line reporting, so we got the finances as well. Obviously you could get that from Plex, but service line reporting gave it us two and provided evidence uh, to prove those clinical hunches and say, yeah, this is actually what's happening. What, what you're thinking is happening is actually right. There's problems uh, from the data perspective and together they're finding the quick wins. So I've, I've no intention of um, walking an audience such as yourselves through a memory assessment service pathway, but I did just want to show you what it looked like in the end. So it's over these two slides and, and essentially, we completely changed the way we delivered um, memory services to our local population. Um, the, I suppose the things to draw your eye to particularly were um, changing. Um, rather than everybody going through the same pathway, the central part then became what we called the hub. So everybody came in, saw a nurse, but then everybody came back to this hub. And from then, we determined where was the right point for that patient to go on to next. So from my perspective as a clinician, the kind of high-end outcomes, um, like I said, we, we completely changed how we delivered services. Um, and we kind of went from that sort of conveyor belt to a hub and spoke model. Um, I think it's worth saying at this point that there was no extra funding available for us for this. We had no extra staff. Um, we had to do all of this just with what we had already. Um, and, you know, during the pandemic, there was a lot of change, right? But we, we did this not because of the pandemic. We did this in spite of the pandemic. And I think that's something that I'm quite proud of. We, we almost saw the pandemic as, as an opportunity to completely wholesale change things, really. And although the, the pathway was completely built around the patient need and what they needed, actually, um, we went on and found that there was loads of knock-on benefits, so particularly thinking about um, staff morale and retention. 
So I'm going to give you some headline outcomes and Nick will drill down in a little bit more detail. But thinking about that wait that patients go through from seeing a nurse to that diagnostic appointment, we went from 155 to 72 days. The 72 days might still seem like a little bit long, but remembering that patients are going off for scanning and imaging, which is outside of our control because that's done by another trust. Um, we saw a dramatic reduction in cancelled appointments, both by us and then also by the patient cancelling. And I think probably in part as a knock-on effect of that, our DNA rates dropped as well. And the consultant-led contacts um, saw a 53% reduction. And again, the effect of that, uh, Nick will go into a bit more detail. Yeah, we haven't got lots of time to go into the, to the, the actual detail part, but... Um, I'll just give you a few headlines. So this, this, what this is basically telling us is we were reliant on an acute trust down the road for the head scans. As Becky said, not every patient was now sent for a head scan. Uh, but what was happening is from referral to the point of the actual scan, it was taking a certain amount of time. And then from, to get from the actual scan to the, get the results, it was taking a certain amount of time. So it was taking a long time that was affecting um, waiting times. It was affecting when you could start the drug, um, prescribing, that kind of thing. Um, so just by moving where the interventions were happening and thinking about actually where's the di diagnosis actually happening, because you can't diagnose if you haven't had the test results back, is obviously going to add value to that patient pathway. So we always had a saying, if you do the right thing for the patient, the costs will follow, uh, the finances will follow, and it usually does. So if you, if you start looking at the patient pathway and you start making changes that are more efficient and looking at value, it does usually affect the, the finances. And this was a win. So we just measured two periods for all the analysis we did. This is the cost of a patient session. Uh, and we saw a reduction in the actual unit price of £75 per contact, which is quite, quite a big reduction. And the reason for this is a number of things. It was when the contacts were happening, the duration of the contacts, um, less, less contacts, so not seeing a patient again and again that wasn't adding value. Um, the scale mix that was involved, so the staff. There was lots of different factors for that. Unattended appointments, Becky's already mentioned it. So, yep, so we saw a massive reduction in this as well, the, the, the amount of patients that weren't turning up. This is because, again, the more patient-centered service, seeing the patient at a different time. Um, obviously, they were able to turn up or answer that phone call. Um, so it's a 44% uh, decrease in DNA from the period before the patient changes uh, to after. And you can argue this all day long about what is the opportunity. So it's not actually a saving, but it's a cost opportunity for um, those missing um, contacts, those missing um, the, the DNAs. So we, we cost them in our Plex service at two minutes just for a bit of admin time. But in some service areas, it's actually a, a session that's remaining vacant. So, you know, the potential opportunity was £82,000. So. Then the radiology appointments. So, obviously, a reduction. It was obviously going to be a reduction because not every patient was having a head scan now. So, 30% reduction in radiology tests. What was the impact of this? Well, we were paying for every scan. The, 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 the acute trust down the road would charge us for every scan. So, obviously, a win there. So. So, in terms, I think, of why the, the EVO project worked for us so well, um, I'm a big believer in relationships, which, given I'm a psychiatrist, is probably no great surprise. Um, but I just think if you've got relationships and you know that person, do you know what? You, you can just overcome most challenges, can't you? And, um, you know, I said at the start, I was a new consultant. I'd never met a costing manager. I'll be honest, I didn't really know what they did. Um, but the fact we were suddenly thrown in a room, and Nick, may regret it these days because I do tend to email him with quite a lot of requests now. Um, but I think relationships was a big win-win, definitely. We had clear buy-in from the trust right from the start, and that was really important. It gave us the confidence, I think, to push through and make the changes we wanted to. I think for me as a clinician, the language of value, I think, was really, really important. Um, from right from the start, the goal behind this was never about you've got to save money. It was always about tell us what you think good quality care looks like. 
Um, and as Nick said, yes, we did save money, but that wasn't the goal. And I think that was why we got real buy-in from, uh, from the clinical team. Evo, however, gave us structures and goals, which we needed. Otherwise, it's one of those things in my world, it would have just slipped on the to-do pile and never got round to. Um, and it, the outcomes, it gave me in a form that I could then go on to use. And we did use, so we initially presented at a national conference. Um, and then Nick and the team helped us get some data back again in terms of the improvements. Um, and we went on to win a, a Royal College of um, Psychiatry Awards last year, which in my world, that's like a big deal. Okay. Um, so that's something I'm really proud of. So what happened next? Yeah, so I, I think this is the real win from it all. So we've kind of, instead of just at the end of the process, we said, that's it now, you know. Can I just say as well, there was a lot of other projects than the memory service. We, we, if you want to look at those as a case study um, that, that you can get to. But um, what we've done now is we've embedded this across the services. So we just go out to Teams, um, show them all the Plex data, the service line reporting, all the activity dashboards and say, right, have you got any hunches? Is there anything you want us to look at? And we start just drilling down while we're there. It only takes an hour and a half. Um, and it's amazing what wins you get from that. And it, you know, it might be just, oh, they're not recording group contacts or something like that, but other things can really change the patient pathway. Um, and if you get, you can find SIP out of that, then, then a win. But so anyway, yeah, we've embedded it in the, in the service. So. That's it, thank you very much. Hopefully I'm not going over. <laughs> no, we're about right, I think. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That's fantastic and, and actually makes my job easier in terms of what I'm going to talk to you about because you've had that, that great illustration of, of what um, the Engagement Value Outcome Framework can do. Um, so I'm just going to take a bit of time to describe what we've been developing through the Innovation Forum. Um, and again, oh, it's great following Julian because he said it before me just like Peter said it before him. So um, we're all grappling with that, you know, how do we do quality and performance and finance? Um, within you know within the resources we've got um and for me working with our own costing information and understanding our services in that kind of detail as, as you've done um is it, and working with clinicians particularly is how we can make that difference um, and how we can see that transformation over time and help us deliver against that challenge so we've collaborated with a lot a lot of i'm thinking the slides are behind me apologies uh, we've collaborated with a, a lot of different organizations um and I'm really pleased to be able to announce that as of this morning, um, the applications are, are officially open for um, the version one of the EVO framework. Um, it's a physical handbook, open source, um, and we'll release it obviously free of charge because that's what we're here for, um, to, to trust once, you know, on a, on a successful application. And it's a significant, you know, step on from our pilot phase. Um, so obviously we've learned a lot from the pilot um, and you know, from colleagues uh, that have run through this before um, and incorporating those valuable insights that have been gained uh, and gathered along the way. Um, we've been collaborating so that when we've got something that might not have an obvious in-year cost benefit, we can measure that and we can measure that in a, a kind of a, a way that we can come back to um, and a way that, we, that balances um, the, val the quality and the resources in that in that value, um, and trying to you know deliver the the overall financial challenge that we've got, managing that, making sure that quality follows you know is, is taken into account because I mean we all know it, don't we? But um, you know just hacking a bit off a service is not is not the best way of doing it. It can improve the quality and reduce the cost at the same time. Is the ideal, isn't it? So I'm just going to you know really quickly talk you through. The Evo journey and what it means and what the the, the framework is now, um, and uh, you know explain some of those outcomes and, and uh, measures that it offers, and as I say, um, aiming to integrate those discussions on uh, quality and cost improvement into that single conversation, um, using value as a as a measurement. And um, value uh, in this context is defined. I think I need to flip on a slide. Um, thank you. Um, Defined as the outcomes of quality um, relative to the cost or resource. Um, so, you know, we don't, we, we perhaps don't 
as finance professionals use that kind of language, but I think as Becky's illustrated really well, um, that's you know how how do we engage clinicians is in talking about those two things in one place, um, and as I say, you know the understanding that cost reduction without maintaining quality, um, you know is not is potentially has a detrimental impact on the quality, on the on delivering effective care, um, and so what Evo seeks to do is empower our teams to measure that value, uh, the impact of a change on the value of those services, and trying to enhance the likelihood of um, organisations making good quality decisions about what transformation, what options to take to improve services. So um, the EVO journey is a central element of this framework and um, it's designed to be completed in a 16-week period. So starting really with board sign-up and again, that's evidence from, from the North Staffs example about actually the organisation really signing up um, is, is key to this. Um, so we've got three stages and um, the beautiful artwork that will pop up. Thanks to Richard. Um, so we start with a, a launch, um, an orbit, and then a landing. And it engages three specialties at once. And the kind of reason for that is to try and build a bit of a peer network within an, within an organisation to say, oh, this is how I'm doing in my specialty, how are you doing in yours, and trying to create a bit of a community of practice around it. Um, so there'll be three simultaneous orbits, and you can see the three... Uh, multidisciplinary teams getting ready for their orbits here in their, in their nice little rockets. Um, so we start with the launch and a 90-minute meeting, uh, setting the tone for the engagement, the teamwork, the collaboration, as I say, across those different specialties and services, as well as for each specialty. Um, and by the end of the meeting, the intention is the three EVO teams have been formed and each team are ready to begin their own orbit. The orbit consists of three sessions, um, each session aiming to last a couple of hours um, and, and evenly spaced across a 12-week period. Um, in that first session, teams are introduced to, to the, the concept of value and the PLICS data, um, defining their own quality measures in that specialty. Um, that's obviously really important for, for local ownership and recording them as local value measures. And we recognise, and again, um, Already, already spoken about. Um, lots of clinicians do have that that clinical hunch. If only, if only I had that information. I, I think, I think this is what's, you know, what's going on here. But you know, where's the where's the evidence for it? Um, and so the team in that first session is to identify three of those um, hypotheses, clinical hunches, um, representing opportunities for improvement. In mo you know, in some cases, those those hunches will be kind of low hanging fruit to the clinicians. Um, and the data-driven framework seeks to try and assess that evidence for each one of those. Um, so preparation for session two um, is then some of the participants, so clearly the, the information, informatics and uh, finance uh, participants, collecting all that available evidence in what we're calling a, a data burn. Um, and then moving on to session two, the team undergoes that structured evaluation process. Um, assessing the probability and the validity of each hypothesis and the intention, the aim out of that session is to come up with one, um, one probable or highly probable opportunity for clinical transformation. So, you know, a hunch has been um, sort of backed up, I suppose, by the evidence. And the aim then is that by the end of session two, the teams will self-assess their progress using markers and the content then of session three depends, varies depending on those markers. Um, not to go into lots of detail just now, but EVO's intended to be a no-fail process. So even if a team's come out of, uh, fi you know, finished their orbit with marker one, which is haven't identified an opportunity for improvement, at least what they've done is get into some of the evidence and the detail and understand their service better. And potentially they might come up with a different hunch and say, actually, we want to go around that orbit again. Um, if, if a specialty team um, finishes with a, their orbit at a marker three, then that means that they've identified a, you know, an opportunity for improvement. They've got a plan um, of how to take that forward. So um, we do get into some numbers and percentages and things, and I hope that's something that everybody's going to enjoy because um, <laughs> we all love a good spreadsheet. Um, so just trying to illustrate how, how the team can decide on then an option for transformation. So we've identified the opportunity, but there'll be lots of different ways that that, that opportunity could be delivered. So um, in session, th we've, we've got, they've identified that in session three, sorry, 
And then this is worked example in using maternity as an example, um, using the tool. So what we've done is say the value metrics and the weightings were agreed by the team in session one. So they've already decided well, how is it they will manage, they will measure what they've, what they've done. Um, and what we've done is an 80-20 split between quality and then 20% resources. So to, to have that weighting. Um, and it, and we also, the tool also considers uh, risk and strategy um, in the calculation. So to the right, um, you can see the options that have been identified. So this team op uh, identified five options for improvement. And what they've done um, is, is, to is then to, to um, weight those, essentially, to, you know, to, to put a score against them, using a Likert scale, so five being... Um, you know, clear, measurable value uh, generation, easy to identify, you know, sort of low risk of failure. And then one is sort of unclear and, and so on. And they're measured against each other, so it's not a sort of external measure, it's just between those uh, options. And we can see that, you know, in this example, option two is um, sort of the one that you see, well, there's most improvement available there. Um, and there's a, another way of, of showing it in a value priorities graph. So then, during that remainder of that session three, teams reviewing the progress and agreeing on the schedule for that upcoming transformation stage, how do they actually implement that option two? Um, so all three teams then, and uh, another beautiful graphic from Richard, um, you know, along with the, actually along with the Evo champions and the trust stakeholders, the board sponsors, um, convened for then a, another 90 minute session called The Landing, where each of the Evo teams present back, this is, you know, this is what we've done. And, and it's seen as a debrief of the, um, the, and like the end of the Evo journey, bringing together their achievements and, and those lessons learned. But for those teams that did achieve marker three and have got an opportunity and, and have identified the option uh, for taking it forward, what we're then suggesting is that people go into a, a PDSA plus cycle, the plus being uh, using Plix data. So we'll all have improvement methodologies in our organisation. So taking this, you know, this isn't sort of prescriptive, it's, you know, what, what works in your organisation. Um, and aiming that that's, you know, quite a quick turnaround. So how, how quickly can we get into that? How, you know, and, and, you know, aiming actually the suggestion from, from the Innovation Forum is that it takes a month. Um, so it is a really quick kind of Im implementation then. Um, and upon completion of that, then undertaking a final session called the Value Impact Assession Assessment. Um, and during that session, first assessing uh, and comparing the quality of the pathway before and after the transformation. So um, you'll, you'll notice we haven't uh, at the moment got the cost element at this, at this point. But the projected pathway is taken directly from the comparison tool that was done in session three. And the team is asked to then score the transformed pathway um, based on their experience and the, the knowledge of the PDSA plus cycle. Um, and then they'll score the original pathway before the Evo journey began. Um, and, and, you know, you can see where we're going with this. It's going to be the, you know, what, what's, the, what's the improvement? Uh, how can we measure that improvement? Um, and then finally, also to, to score what's the quality aspiration? So where would we really like to go? So we've got a long way down this transformation, but actually is the, is the further that people, you know, can see could happen, um, you know, and after a few more cycles of improvement. Um, we then uh, feed those scores into what we're calling the value impacts comparison tool, um, and these, you know, pull across in the previous slide, and the, an average percentage of, uh, applied um, or calculated. Um, the resources and cost in session three were measured um, but then having completed the PDSA plus cycle, the team can enter the percentage variance from budget. So we should be able to then say, well, the new pathway has a different uh, cost profile than the, the previous pathway. Um, and then combining those scores gives us an overall value impact comparison score um, or VIC score. Um, and this team's transform pathway, you can see, shows a 35% improvement across those, those measurements. Um, and potentially a further 4% if we get to that quality aspiration, uh, sort of, you know, the even better bit. Um, and what we're trying to share and, and have available for people is, is you know, the VIX score being a, a powerful tool, uh, you know, an understood tool, um, particularly if organisations, as we've heard, you know, go on to keep doing this and keep, keep using this cycle um, for, for uh, communicating the impact of the EVO process. Um, and you know, improving the care quality and, and financial uh, efficiency and being able to measure that. 
And then another important output is the transformation statement. So summarising the journey all the way through from hypothesis through to that evaluation um, and, the, and the comparison and the, that improvement that we've you know, hopefully seen. It, it feels like I've talked quite a lot about spreadsheets. So um, <laughs> it is designed to be kind of concise, accessible, trying to give you all, us all, the tools already there rather than, again, rather than reinventing the wheel. Um, so, um, you know, ho hopefully enabling stakeholders to quickly understand that transformation progress and that impact. Um, and potentially, one of the key outputs could be that sort of 24 weeks after signing a board commitment, the director of finance, the medical director could have in their hands, you know, three statements if those three specialties have all been successful and got all the way through, have three statements that each detail and that improvement, that value impact that that process has had. Um, so just briefly turning to um, who's involved. So we've got three pillars. Uh, we've got finance, clinical and um, project. And we've got distinctive roles in there. So champions uh, in terms of uh, board leadership, um, leads and participants. And the champions act as sponsors, delegating their authority to the EVO leads and, and, and giving that overall um, almost permission, in a sense. Um, and the four EVO leads, though, are, are absolutely pivotal, pivotal uh, and driving that entire EVO journey from launch through to landing. Um, and then additional uh, participants, as with many other things, uh, other, other participants almost certainly will be identified, I think, by the champions. Um, you know, who else do we need to, to bring into this and, and identify those prior to the launch and forming those diverse teams with a great, greater depth of knowledge of the service. So the outputs um, throughout the process, we've got three transformation statements, three VIC scores, that detailed list of archived actions that perhaps didn't make it this time, but uh, will be you know, a potentially useful in future. Um, and hopefully, something that, again, Rebecca uh, talked about quite a lot, about those relationships and those close-knit interdisciplinary teams um, using that concept of value to evidence their improvements and hopefully future improvements as well. Um, I guess, as I've said, really, outcomes will vary based on the progress of each orbit, um, and you can you know, see some of that on the slide. Um, I guess where I started in terms of selecting three um, specialties to build that community of practice, of course, we could do that across an ICS as well. So if different organisations within an ICS are taking on this tool, actually the power of that, and would there be something about an ICS saying, you know, actually, let's join up some of those specialties um, and, you know, trying to trying to manage that. So whilst we're rolling out EVO 1, um, we, we are working with an ICS on EVO 2, which will try and help that kind of system level. Um, so the, the certification, nice um, badges to put on emails and things like that. Um, and the certification uh, is available to any organisation that completes that journey. Um, and, and leads and participants will be invited to join the, the EVO ambassador network and try and create, create that community of practice across the whole organ, uh, the whole country, um, and try and you know do that network and uh, networking and supporting each other in the adoption of the methodology. Um, so, in conclusion, um, we believe you know uh, this is a real opportunity. It's standardised. It's already there. You don't need to to kind of work out how to do it uh, locally. Um, and it can slot into things that you're already doing locally. So it's not, you know, it's not that we think nobody is doing something like this, but is this, is this some of this tool that can help in something that you're already doing? Um, so, you know, aiming to revolutionise really the value-based decision-making within NHS Trust um, and fostering that collaboration, prioritising patients. This is version 1.0, so it is iterative. Um, we have learned from the pilot. We hope we learn as we go through, as, you know, as organisations sign up um, and, and that feedback that we get from early adopters. And I guess really I'd just strongly encourage you to, to think about signing your organisation up and empower your teams to spearhead that positive change. So, okay. thank you. Thank you, Jenny. So, um, I'm just going to ask two quick questions, if that's all right. I, I, I won't hold you back from your coffee for too long, but I, uh, I want to talk a little bit about engagement. So, I've got some questions for you, for you, Rebecca and Nick. And Rebecca, for you, we've been asked, what's the best way to engage clinicians? I've taken lots of data to mind, but struggle to get that engagement. So, what, what are your tips for us about in getting engagement? Uh, go and meet your clinicians. Um, the difficulty I have is if, you know, if I've got to 
go somewhere else to go and meet, you know, costing finance colleagues. The, the amount of clinical work I always has, is, that's always going to trump everything else. It, it has to. So if you can, just go to them and go and meet them. Um, and like I said, I think in my presentation, I think language, I think, is really key. So language about this is about the patient, this is about quality care, this is about value. It, it, it's not necessarily about yeah. saving money. Yeah. <laughs> Even if that may well be the consequence. Yeah, it was a happy, happy result if it is. Um, fantastic. And Nick, for you, um, someone asked the biggest engagement barrier they've experienced with PLIX data and costing is not with the clinicians, but actually from the rest of finance. Uh, have you experienced any of that? And have you, have you kind of embedded costing within finance? Um, I think we've been in a, quite a good position because we're supported by our director of finance. And we've kind of started taking reports to the board um, through our, our F&R committees and that kind of thing. So, we're at, so they're actually cited on the information, so we've got that support. And then obviously through that, um, the reports are being seen by the rest of finance. We also link it with financial management because that's absolutely imperative. Um, because if you want to start changing things at source and that, you need th them involved to do that. Um, so yeah, I think our organisation is, is in a good position, but I think primarily start sharing the information at the right level. Because I think costing is the future, as far as I'm concerned. Fantastic. I would say that one time. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I think it is. So we need, you need to start sharing yeah. at the right level. Fantastic. I'm happy to take that as the final thought on this session. <laughs> I think it's entirely appropriate. Um, and never apologise for sharing spreadsheets, Jenny. I think that's entirely fine. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Nick, uh, for a fantastic session. Um, I'll ask you to, um, to thank um, in the normal way in just a second. But if I... <laughs> And, and if I could ask people to be back in the room promptly by five past 12, I think we'll go for. Um, so see you back in here for the next session. Thank you.